This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak with New York-based musician and actor Matt Gumley, and he talks to me about the process of writing his first song lyrics, dealing with rejection as both an actor and a musician, and being creative in the incredible city of New York. Hey, it's James Taylor. I'm delighted today to have Matt Gumley. Matthew Gumley is a New York-based musician and actor. He got his start early, performing on Broadway as Chip in Beauty and the Beast at the age of seven. Since then, he's appeared in multiple Broadway musicals, including Mary Poppins, The Addams Family, and Elf the Musical. You might also recognize Matt from his appearances on hit TV shows such as Law & Order, Modern Family, and The Americans. However, it's the song that is at the core of who Matt is as a creative person. And it was while performing on Broadway that he discovered his true passion was music and songwriting. His debut EP, Six Degrees of Separation, is just about to come out and the single Subway Rider has just been released. And it's my pleasure to have Matt on the show today. Welcome to the show, Matt. Hi, thanks for having me, James. So share with our listeners, what's going on in your world just now? Oh boy, everything. We're trying to move forward as, uh, as quickly and as efficiently as we possibly can. We're, um, we're currently in the works on uh, finishing up our EP, which, we, um, which we're going to be releasing uh, later this month in June. So by the time this podcast is released, hopefully it'll be out and y'all can listen to it. We, um, we just released our first single called Subway Rider, as you said, and um, we're just really moving forward with it. We're shooting a bunch of music videos. We have a Subway Rider music video that should be out by the time this is out. And we're shooting another music video right now for one of the other songs on the album. So we're really moving forward. At the end of, uh, at the end of June, we're actually going to be playing a small EP release show for a, a pretty closed um, audience. But we'll be filming that as well, and hopefully we'll be releasing some of the footage from that. And then for the months of July and August, I'd like to be out with, um, with my band playing around as much as possible. That's the, uh, that's the goal as of right now, and we're just really trying to just stay moving forward and keep that ball moving, you know? And how did you first kind of get started in your craft as as a musician? I mean, I mentioned you you started in Broadway uh, musicals very very early in your life as well. But where did the, the music part specifically? Where did it kind of get started? Who were you? Those kind of early inspirations, those early kind of teachers for you? Well, I have to say my uh, my parents played a really big part in my uh, musical taste. My father was a, a hippie in the '60s, and my mother was was uh, born in the '60s, so was raised with the classic you know, James Taylor, Carol King type sound of the 70s, which are some of the greatest songs ever written, in my opinion. So for me, I grew up in a household listening to a combination of the Beatles, Jimi Hendrix, James Taylor, Carol King, and all of these absolutely genius and legendary songwriters. And um, I think being exposed to that at the young age that I was really, really helped me and formed my songwriting and my musicianship later in life. Uh, I've played the piano uh, since I was five. I was classically trained, and I, I still play to this day. And I, it's the only instrument I've actually ever taken lessons in. Everything else I, I pretty much just picked up on my own. And it was one of those things where once I discovered um, the piano, and then that was that was going for a while, and I, I never really had an affinity for anything else until I turned about 14. And I did a show in New Jersey where it required me to play the ukulele for a scene. So my grandmother bought me my first ukulele, and it was after that that I kind of learned and mastered the ukulele and figured out how that worked. My mind became more expansive and wanted to explore more of a neck, so it transferred over to guitar and then over to bass, and then I picked up the rhythmic instruments. I picked up drums and all that stuff, and I can, I can pretty much wrap my hands around, around anything with strings, banjo, mandolin, sitar, any of that stuff. Um, <sighs> Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I was, I was going to say that you mentioned the ukulele there. I always think of, of ukulele, ukulele as the gateway drug to the guitar. It's like the, the thing that gets people really on the journey because it's like, you know, a guitar, especially, you know, I know for kids as well um, and also for little, maybe older learners, the guitar always feels can feel a little bit intimidating. With a ukulele, Absolutely. it's small, it's trans, you know, it's portable, it's fun. Um, Absolutely. It's got a very sweet sound to it. You can yeah. take it to the beach with you. You can take it anywhere with you. 
it's it's a it's a great. But then obviously you kind of got in from that into playing all these other string instruments as well. And when you you were kind of fourteen, and w- when did it? So you started doing all these other shows uh, and things as well. Uh, wh- where did the song re- writing bit start? Um, wh- when, so, when that po- that point? I mean, I would say the songwriting kind of started with my my first heartbreak when I was fourteen. Kind of triggered me to write some of my first lyrics and some of my first songs ever. Really, I'd never thought about being creative with uh, songwriting before. I'd been a pretty good creative writer in school, like in English class, but I was I had never really th- thought about taking um, songwriting seriously. And it kind of took that and uh, it forced me into that mindset and I just had stuff that I needed to get out and I put it down all on the paper and it ended up you know, turning into one of my first couple songs I ever wrote. So I think uh, a lot of people's first songs come from something traumatic like a like a first heartbreak or something like that so <laughs> nowadays obviously the the, the 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 childhood heartbreaks are now a thing of the past but so where do you go now for your inspiration what what kind of gets the creative juices going for you and then how do you go about kind of developing those song and those lyrical ideas see it's you know it's kind of it's everything hmm it's a hard question to answer because there is no specific method there is no um writer and there's no right or wrong way to do it but there is for me i don't really have a template in which it's like okay well i go to this spot at 4 30 and i sit down and i write my song on wednesday afternoons it's like every song is different a lot of times a change of scenery will force my musicianship in a different direction if i'm up in colorado and i'm playing in the rockies and i'm looking out on the mountains i'm gonna play something different than if i'm sitting on a beach listening to the ocean so for me, location is a lot of it. Um, if I'm co-writing with people, that changes everything because then you have two brains in the works who have two separate ideas, and then when they meet in the middle and you collaborate, you find that really su- that sweet spot. That's where a lot of inspiration comes from for me. Um, I just try to take most of my um, most of my songwriting and lyrics and music and all that stuff just from personal experience, and I try to really bring it from the heart. Um, I'm a storyteller too, but I try to keep all of my stuff true to me and uh, realistic to me, so that I think it can be a little more relatable for everyone else. So you mentioned you're know, thinking of yourself as as a storyteller as well. I mentioned some in, in the background to you. You've obviously you got involved in acting at a very young age, and sure. uh, you've kind of you, you you're doing a lot of acting all the time as well. So when when someone says to you, so what are you? Are you a are you a musician? Are you an actor? What what's the bit that you tend to lead from, or or, or do you basically just like have your life separate? These are just different things, different parts of your personality that you do. I mean, they really are different things in different parts. But now when people ask me what I do, I say I'm a musician. I'm an, I'm an artist in, in New York City. I, um, I still do act and I audition sometimes, but I've really been selective with what I've been taking recently because it gives me more time to really focus on, on my passion, which has been music. It got to the point where acting, I love it and I feel like I've been, you know, all right at it so far in the past i've i've been really really lucky to say that i've i've worked a lot and um it got to the point where uh, as i got older it started to become more about the job than about the joy of getting on stage you know i found i found it hard which is a, a problem that a lot of actors have especially screen actors when they're transferring over to the stage is making it fresh every night which is which is hard when you're doing the same lines, the same character, the same things over and over. You have to try and find what's special about every performance every time. So for me, that got a little taxing and a little, a little hard, honestly. And, and it scared me once I caught myself saying, oh boy, I can't wait for this show to close. That was scary. I had never said that before. So it was at that moment that I realized, well, then maybe this isn't really what I was meant to do. And I, it was at that moment that I really started picking up all of the I mean it wasn't really at that moment that I started picking up all the instruments but it was when the songwriting really picked up and it was when the the ball started to get moving as far as um as far as me being an artist goes uh and and doing it professionally that was that was where it happened was when I found myself saying oh I don't know if acting's a thing for me anymore and I went well we might as well just go full swing with this music then because I was mentioning, you know, but you're still doing you're, the acting is still there. Something that you do, it's just that you're not really pushing it. You're you're basically letting the the songwriting and the music side uh, that that's your that's your primary focus for just now. 
Exactly. And I've been, I've been acting, you know, I've, I did my first professional job when I was four and I did my first Broadway show when I was seven. So I've been in the acting world for over a decade and it's, and it's been fun and it's been great, but it's, I think it's time for a change. And as I'm getting older, I'm recognizing that too. And then the, the, the opportunities that you are taking up when it comes to the acting side, now you can be a bit more selective because you have this focus on, on the mute, on the music. So on the acting things, what, what what stuff will you will interest you now? Or is mostly, it- it's mostly going to be like film and television stuff, to be honest, because theater tends to lock down a lot of your schedule. You have rehearsals from ten a.m. to six p.m. Monday through Saturday, or um, Tuesday through Sunday, with usually your Monday Monday as your day off, um, and. So when you're doing theater and you're also trying to do a, a music career full time, they don't really coincide. You know, you'll have a lot of conflicting days and conflicting schedules. So, in order to give myself as much free time as possible to devote as much of my time to the music as possible, I'm really limiting the theater jobs that I'm considering taking and all of that, just because those really do lock you down. Most theaters um, will end up having like a month to you know a couple a couple weeks to a month or maybe more of rehearsals. And then you have shows at night. Now, if I'm doing shows at night on a stage, that means that I can't go out and play shows at night with my band, right? Yeah. So that's why film and TV is really nice because then you pretty much just work. I mean, it depends on the project. You could have a night shoot, I guess. But if you are on a TV set, it's more likely you'll be able to work around a couple days shoot than a couple month excursion with a show. And I think I saw you um, you in the other day, uh, a great TV series um, that we have here in the UK called The Americans uh, as well. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to remember the actual, the scene that you were, the, the epic, particular episode you, invo- <laughs> you involved in, because it was like this, it's like, I you think have it was to fourth, very, fourth very series. Closely. Yeah. You have to look very, very closely for me. I am in, there's a scene where Paige is sitting in her living room and she has this band over and they're playing Mississippi Queen. And they're kind of playing it badly, and then this this girl kind of shows up with her frizzy hair, you know, all 80s looking, and then she kind of takes the lead guitar and kind of rips it a little bit and steals the front man's attention from Paige to this girl, and then she kind of is left feeling like, oh, you know, second best a little bit. But in that band, I was the bassist. <laughs> <laughs> You're the guy. So when it comes to your music, I mean – Actors of famous for having to deal with rejection because you're you, people going up, you're going up for re- thing, uh, auditions all the time. Oh, yeah. What what role does rejection play as in the life of a of a musician and as a songwriter? Because uh, you're, oh, not, you're, you're not going up, you're not going up for as many you're not going really going up for auditions I would imagine. So where does rejection sit? Oh, I mean, I absolutely do go out for auditions and I've been rejected my whole life. And, and if anything, it's taught me perseverance and uh, to not give up because any you know. There's a lot of actors who come straight out of college and these professors tell them that they're going to have these budding careers and then they get into the real world and they realize it's cutthroat. And then a lot of people end up giving up because they don't realize the work that it takes and really the perseverance that it takes because it takes a certain amount of dedication and willpower to be able to overcome someone saying, you know what, we, you're, not, you're not the right look. So, and that's why music was great is music was a fantastic outlet for a lot of those emotions after being rejected and all of those things and feeling like you're not right for something. And that's, that's when you pick up the guitar and you start writing. So, um, rejection is something that I've been dealing with my whole life and it's made me a very, very strong person. In my opinion, I I think I'm a pretty strong person. Um, Uh, and imagine being in in New York as well. I mean, New Yorkers are not uh, known uh, for for holding back their views. (laughs) are a small fish in a very, very big ocean here in New York City, especially as an actor and even more especially as a musician. So it takes, especially doing anything creative in this city, it takes a lot of balls, it takes a lot of guts, and um, it takes a lot of, as my father would say, stick to hmm. But is it, is, it, what, is it being in that kind of center, that, that, that type of city where you have everything there there is an industry there you, you prefer that to maybe being in um i'm trying to think of some maybe some other other cities where maybe they have a strong music scene like you know austin or portland and things like that as well there's something about new york for you yeah i mean aside from the fact that it's been my home yeah i feel like there's something about the live music scene in downtown new york it's just it's just dirty it's just better it's like I just I love it, and LA is um, is I feel like LA is so clean cut when it comes to the music and 
all of that stuff. But I love the grunge of New York, and I love the grime and the and the and the um, uh, what do you call it? Like the um, there's an authenticity there, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. It's like this people, you know, Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell have been playing down at the bitter end for you know. They were playing there in the, in the early 60s, singing, you know, the anti-government songs. So the, the music scene has been rich in New York practically since music's inception, I suppose you could say. And, so, and can you talk about maybe in, in, this, in this journey you've had as a, as a creative person, you first coming from the acting, then the music and the songwriting. Um, can you tell us about a time when you, you worked on a project, you worked on something, and you gave it your, your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason, it just didn't work out like you'd hoped. And more importantly, what were the the lessons that you took away from that experience? I mean, writing songs, you deal with that a lot. But at the same time, there was there were projects that I worked on, like, I'll just give you an example, like The Addams Family. It was just one of those things where it wasn't exactly how they said it was going to be. And I ended up having uh, quite a smaller part than it was originally said. And I ended up being the understudy for um, Pugsley, which is fine and I was absolutely happy doing it because uh, I had never been an understudy before. I've always been the main character and I've always been the one who's had the understudy. So sitting back and taking that step back for a second and sitting in that position where you are definitely not in the limelight. You are very much in the ensemble. No one saw my face in that show. I was a puppeteer for two or three of the scenes and uh, I came out for the bows at the very end. I didn't even have a costume. So I, it was something like that where I had to find the positive in that experience, which was I had never done something like that before. So it was great to sit back and realize what it was like to be a swing, to be an ensemble member, to have that camaraderie with your other ensemble members and not your other principal characters. So like things like that happen all the time where you get into a project and you imagine it's going to be something, it's going to be great and blah 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 or whatever you think it's going to be and then it turns out that it's not that way and then you kind of have to just roll with the punches and uh figure it out as you go but i have to say i've i've never regretted a single experience i've ever had uh everything i've had i've learned from absolutely indefinitely and in this creative journey that you've had um can you tell us about a time where you maybe had an insight or a light bulb moment you've you've maybe hit a crossroads in your life and in, in, in your your career as a as a creative and you've said well okay this is the direction i'm going to go or okay this is a decision i need to make this is a, you know i need to decide which way i'm going to go on this or um you know you've had some that kind of insight that that light bulb has kind of gone off in your head you're tr- you're asking me to define the moment where I decided that I wanted to be a musician, or <laughs> or or, ju- or even just you know m- you know you're talking about music as well. Obviously, I'm sure that within or, in the context of just on the music side, as you've you've been oh, doing that, there's maybe bulb- been things, that des- decisions you've had to make. The light bulb went off when I was a baby, man. It just it's <laughs> always it's always been there for real. It's just one of those things where it's just it's been in me, and it took certain experiences in my life as I matured and as I got older to bring that to the forefront of my mind and realize that that's what I wanted to do. And then really the biggest light bulb that was like, wow, this is real, this is happening, was when we finished the EP. That was like, oh, wow, this is a real thing. Like We're really going forward with this. We've created four complete songs going on an EP that people will be able to buy and listen to. That was like, wow, this is real. This is real life. And was that was that experience of doing doing the the kind of first EP was anything like you'd envisioned? No, no. <laughs> I I mean I've never I've never recorded in a professional setting with anyone before. I mean I I ended up taking my bedroom in Midtown Manhattan and soundproofing you know the living crap out of it and ended up putting a drum kit in here and microphones and studio equipment and all that stuff. So I've been actually recording my own music for like three years without anyone's help. And then I actually met my co-writer, Austin, by an absolute stroke of chance, fate, whatever you want to call it. We, were both, uh, we both won the lotto for Book of Mormon, for the, for the Broadway show Book of Mormon here in New York City. His name was called, and then my name was called. And we ended up standing next to each other in line at the box office waiting for our tickets and just somehow struck up conversation. That was another big light bulb. After I went home, I kind of thought to myself, hmm, that's quite interesting, isn't it? And, that, and then, so that, that that's your kind of you know the, that is the McCartney to your Lennon. That's your kind of creative yes. your, your foil, your creative pair. Absolutely, the um, 
the uh, the Tyler to my Perry, if you will. <laughs> and obviously, you're as you're you're now developing as an artist. I'm sure you're coming up with you're coming. You're meeting lots of other artists who are in the next couple of uh, levels up from where you're you're looking at. You want to kind of get there. But what's some of the best advice that you've ever received about um, making a, a living and, and and being successful as a as a creative artist? If it's what you love, you're not. Go, you're not doing anything wrong. There are no right or wrong answers. You choose everything yourself, and ultimately your your path is something that you make for yourself, and there are no right or wrong answers. Don't give up is what everyone has told me. Is just stick with it. It'll pay off if it's what you love, and it's, and it's really what you love to do, and you enjoy making other people. Because ultimately, for me, it's about making people feel good. I write songs, and if someone, if I play someone one of my songs, and they say to me, you know what, I was having a really bad day, and then I heard one of your songs, and it put me in a good mood. That is absolutely the biggest payoff for me as a musician. And so, for me, it's just, don't give up, and if, and if what you're doing is, is changing people's lives in even the smallest way, if, you're, if you change one life, if you just uplift someone's day, then really it's worth it. It doesn't matter how much you get paid. It doesn't matter how many gigs you play. It doesn't matter how many albums you put out. If you can change someone's life, then I've done my job. And uh, So you meant, obviously, this idea of perseverance is kind of very kind of core to you. So what, when, when you're in that, those moments where either you've, you've had a, a rejection, you know, you've not picked up that, you know, that, that gig that you wanted, they've said no to the band, or this this maybe this radio station you, you're going to be doing something for, they say, no, when you have those kind of moments, what pulls you through? What keeps you going? The music. The music, just sitting down and, and, and when, when you're frustrated, write. When you're happy, write. Whenever you're emoting, sit down and write. <laughs> you are going to get the most out of it because uh, I think music, music is one of the greatest outlets for any type of energy ever. I, you know, whenever people are feeling angsty or angry, they lock themselves in a the room and what do they do? They throw on their headphones and they throw on their favorite song and they, they try to tune out the world. Music is able to do that for people. Um, and music has done that for me. So whenever I find myself in those times of, uh, of trouble or question or any of that stuff, I, uh, I sit down and I write and I, I go to the music. So on that note, if you could recommend just one album and one book to our listeners that you think they should check out, what would they be? Oh, really? If you want me to be honest, as far as like, oh man, this is the hardest question I've ever been asked. <laughs> like I'm trying to think, like I want to, I want to say. At this point, I will not be disappointed if you say Britney Spears' album or something. No, <laughs> no! <laughs> no I was going to say something like Rubber Soul or Tapestry or something yeah. like that. So which, was, which one would you go for? Which one would, is there an album that you've gifted more often than others, to, or you've told people to check out more often than tapestry others? Tapestry is something. Oh, and and the first Crosby, Stills and Nash record is something I've always um, drawn people towards. Uh, the three part harmony, and that is just absolutely legendary. And what about I, on the book? Is there is there is there a book that you've that you've read more often, or a book that you've you've gifted to other people more often? The Alchemist is an incredible book, and if you have not read it, I highly recommend you do. Great book. It's a really, really fantastic, fantastic read. I've read it multiple times myself, and I read it. I read it when I find myself lost, just in whatever that means. When I'm, whenever I just feel out of place or lost, I sit down and I just read one of the chapters in that book, and it kind of just gives me a fresh perspective on everything. It's really, really, really wonderful. And do, do you have an online resource or a tool or an app like a, an Evernote that you that you absolutely love? I mean, I use Google Docs. <laughs> um, the Google Docs I use, uh, you know, to write all of my lyrics between my co-writer and I. So, um, so that's how you, 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 so you can be kind of co-writing in different places, but you use Google Docs as, as, as the as the way to to exchange that information. I mean, yeah, we're usually in the same room, but we usually come up with all of our concepts together, absolutely, and then we'll we'll divide and conquer and go off, and then if he has an idea, he'll stick it in the Google Doc, and if I have an idea, I'll stick it in the Google Doc, and then the next time we meet up, we kind of see if we can't make it work. 
Great. And we'll put, we'll put links to all of these, you know, there's the albums and the book and everything on the show notes. People go to jamestaylor.me. Just type in Matt Gumley. You're going to get the links for all these as well. So final question for you. Let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So you've got all the tools of your trade, the knowledge that you've acquired, the skills you've acquired over the years, but you ha- have no contacts. No one knows who you are. How would you restart? Go to the live gigs. Go downtown and meet the people. That's what you got to do when you don't know anyone and you don't really know what to do. You need people to help you, especially in this industry. So go out. Go go to Rockwood Music Hall. Go to the Bitter End. Go to go to any of those places. Any of these live music venues that have live music and bands that play, because live bands attract other live bands. So when you go, you have no idea who's going to be sitting in that audience watching that band. You could be sitting next to the next Jimmy Page, seriously, and you would have absolutely no idea unless you said, oh, that's a cool guitar, man. And he says, oh, yeah, man, I like your guitar. That's really cool. You say, hey, my name's Matt. He says, hey, my name's Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> so ultimately, when you, if you're starting over from scratch, the best thing you can do is know the most people. Just know everyone. Be a people person. Go out there. Be charismatic. Uh, be personable, be um, a little bit in people's faces. I mean, make sure that you're known. Can it get out there and hustle? Exactly. That's what it is. You yeah, have to play. The New York hustle. You ha- especially in New York, you have to play the game. Well, Matt, it's been a pleasure having you on the show today. I wish you all the best with the, the new P, the new EP and the single that's, uh, that's coming out as well. What's the best way that people can connect with you, can find out uh, if you've got any shows coming up and, and everything else about you? You can go um, to any of my social media pages. We have a Matt Gumley Facebook page. We have a Matthew Gumley Twitter page. I have a Matt Gumley Instagram page. I have a website you can go to, mattgumley.com, which we'll be updating all the time as soon as things become relevant we'll post them up there so that people can see um so yeah if you just follow me on the socials and uh and stay tuned to my website you'll be up to date on pretty much everything that happens with the career cool and we'll put all the links on the show notes as well matt thank you so much for coming on the show it's been a pleasure speaking to you today um, i wish you all the best with the ep hey thanks very much james it was a pleasure being here appreciate it hey james taylor here again And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.